Yeah. Y'all yeah, ain't never heard nothing like this oh, yeah. before. Wazir on the track. Uh, uh, yeah. Come on. Yeah. 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 Feel good. Uh, tell the truth. Yeah. Uh, I love I it. You. Yeah, I let it. Y'all build a city. I know this. But now we know this. Yeah. 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 In the state we in, yeah. we got somebody else living in the palace. Oh, yeah. Trying to keep it thought fresh like salad. Uh -huh. And I'm trying to tell the truth, no malice. Yes. They know yes. I stand yes. on the shoulders yes. of the great. My ancestors gonna keep me straight. I'm talking uh -huh. bird right and the state. Status jurisdiction and adjudicate. They don't think we're supposed to know that our full control. No silk road, we started up that commerce. You try to keep me out, you better put me first. Cause your wouldn't be no more. no more. If it had not been for the more, more. y'all people wouldn't take no bad. Now you wrote the constitution, don't make me laugh. Y'all really should praise my folk. Where I'm at, y'all neck in the yoke. Uh -huh. Medieval time was a slippery yeah. slope. Yeah. Tell me about a bad house, yeah. thing yeah. called soap. Yeah. Peroxide and alcohol. Uh -huh. Clean with the bathrooms and the gold. In the name of humanity, we ask to call. My people made sure that the world didn't fall. Hope. Uh -huh. Yeah, we the great people. Mothers and fathers of humanity. That's right. The whole world has taken from us the Morris Empire. Dark skinned people all across the planet. Yes. This They were white and they were slaves. The untold history of the enslavement of whites in early America. Introduction. There were two sorts. First, such were brought over by masters of ships to be sold as servants. Such as we call them, my dear, says she, but they are more properly called slaves. Daniel Defoe. Mall Flanders. This is a history of white people that has never been told in any coherent form, largely because most modern historians have, for reasons of politics or psychology, refused to recognize white slaves in early America as just that. Today, not a tear shed for the suffering of millions of our own enslaved forefathers. 200 years of white slavery in America have been almost completely obliterated from the collective memory of the American people. Who wants to be reminded of half, perhaps as many as thirds of the original American colonists came here, not of their own free will, but kidnapped, Shanghai, impressed, duped, beguiled, and yes, in chains. We tend to gloss over it. We prefer to forget the whole uh, sorry chapter. Elaine Kendall, Los Angeles Times, September 1st, 1985. A correct understanding of the authentic history of the enslavement of whites in America could have profound consequences for the future of the races. We cannot be sure that the position of the earliest Africans differed markedly from that of the white indentured servants. The debate has considerable significance for the interpretation of race relations in American history. Eugene D. Genovese, Roe, Jordan Roe, The World, The Slaves Made. Most of the books on white labor in early America are titled with words like white indentured servitude, white bond servant, white servants, etc. 
it is interesting that white people who are bound to a condition of what became in many cases permanent chattel slavery and to debt are not referred to as slaves by establishment academics. With the massive concentration of educational and media resources on the Negro experience of slavery, the unspoken assumption has been that blacks have been enslaved to any degree or magnitude were there a study of memorial. The historical record revealed that this is not the case. However, white people have been sold as slaves for centuries. White slavery in ancient and medieval Europe. Among the ancient Greeks, despite their tradition of democracy, the enslavement of fellow whites, even fellow Greeks, was the order of the day. Aristotle considered white slaves as a thing. The Romans also had no compunctions against enslaving whites who they turned to turn a, a thing. Brass. In his agricultural writings, the first century BC Roman philosopher Varro labeled white slaves as nothing more than tools that happen to have voices. Instrumentai vocale. Cato the Elder, discoursing on plantation management, proposed that white slaves, when old or ill, should be discarded along with worn out farm implements. Julius Caesar enslaved as many as one million whites from Gaul, some of whom were sold to the slave dealers who followed his victorious regions, William D. Phillips Jr. slavery from Roman times to the early transatlantic slave. Page 18. In AD 319, the Christian quote unquote Emperor Rome, Emperor Rome Constantine ruled that if an owner whipped his white slave to death, he should not stand in any criminal accusation if the slave dies and all statutes of limitation and legal interpretation are hereby set aside, quote unquote. The Roman enslaved thousands of the early white inhabitants of Great Britain who were known as Angles, from which we derive the term Anglo-Saxons, quote unquote, as a description of the English race. In the sixth century, Pope Gregory the first witnessed the first witness, blind haired, blue eyed English boy awaiting sale in a slave market in Rome. Inquiring of their origin, the Pope was told they were Angles. Pope Gregory replied, non Angli, said Angli la, not Angles, but Angels. When the Franks conquered the Visigoths in southern Gaul, Huge numbers of white entered the slave market. After Charlemagne's conquest of Saxony, during which many pagan Saxons were enslaved, he set up a network of parish churches to provide the, the maintenance of the priests and the church. Those living in the parish were to donate a house and land as well as a male and female Saxon slave to the church for every 120 people in the parish. William Phillips, page 52. Arabs and, and the traffic of white slaves. The trade in white slaves was one of the few sources of foreign exchange for Western European powers in a period when the East produced the goods the Europeans could not produce elsewhere. The sale of white slaves to Asia and Africa was one of the few sources for gold for European treasuries. From the 8th to the 11th century, France was a major transfer port for white slaves to the Muslim world, with Rouen being the center of, I mean, the center for the selling of Irish and Flemish slaves. 
at the same time the front that France was a transfer punk for slaves to the Muslim world, Italy was uh, occupying much the same position. Ph- Phoenicians were selling slaves and timber across the Mediterranean. The slaves were usually slaves brought, brought across the Alps. The Venetians were the earliest successful Italian sea traders and became profits on slave trade in the Muslims were lucrative. They resisted efforts to stop them in return for their export of timber, iron, and white slaves. They brought in oriental luxury products, mainly fine cloths. William Phillips, page 62 through 63. The stereotype of the establishment consensus history is of the Muslim slaver herding chains black through the desert. In fact, for several 700, for 700 years until the fall of Muslim Spain, those being herded were first and foremost overwhelmingly white. Before the 10th century, the, the Muslims generally bought Christian Europeans as slaves. By the 10th century, slaves became the most numerous imported group during the late Middle Ages until the fall of Granada in the late 15th century. Most slaves of the Muslim were Christian from the Northern Kingdom, William Phillips, page 69. In the fast lands of Eastern Europe, steps from the 8th to the 12th century, there was a well-developed slaving network. Slaves and Slaves and Fins called uh, Saquila La Villa slaves indiscriminately by the Muslims entered the Muslim world by these Caspian and Black Sea routes. William Phillips, page 63 through 64. The faith of hundreds of thousands of white slaves sold to Arabs was described in one Spanish text as atrocima et forissima, most atrocious and harsh. The men were worked to death as galley slaves. The women, girls, and boys were used as prostitutes. White males had their genitals mutilated in castration attempts bloody procedures of incredible brutality which most of the white men who were forced to submit did not survive. Judging from the high prices white eunuchs commanded throughout the Middle Eastern slave market. Escape from North Africa and the Middle East was almost impossible and those white slaves who were caught trying to flee were punished by having their noses and their ears cut off or worse. Early Muslim texts provided insights. Early Muslim texts provided insights into the extent to which the Arab identified Europeans with slavery, classified white slaves as animals, and even produced learned racist uh, dis- discussions on the supposed merits of emasculated East European slaves. In his 9th century treatise on beasts, the book of animals, the Muslim scholar Jahiz writes, another change which overcomes the unit of two slaves of Slavic race who are twins, one castrated and the other not, the unit becomes more disposed towards service, wiser, more able, and apt for various problems of manual labor. All these qualities you find only in the castrated ones. On the other hand, his brother continues to have the same native topar, the same lack of natural talent, and the same imbecility common to slaves and incapacity for learning a foreign language. 
uh, Charles the Linden, the slave in medieval Europe. So that's just an example from the book. Uh, they were white and they were slaves. To show you, you know, like, it's, it's not a secret with them. Like, they know that they were the first slaves. They know Europeans know that they were the slaves. White Cargo. The Forgotten History of Britain's White Slaves in America. The Forgotten History of Britain's White Slaves in America. Don Jordan and Michael Walsh. Introduction. In the shadow of the myth, slavery can, slavery they can have everywhere. It's a weed that grows in every sorrow. Edmund Burke. That man who is property of another is his mere chattel, though he continue a man. Aristotle, a treatise on government. Just read and the other thing what Aristotle said was it was just a thing. Slavery was just a thing to them. But they were talking about Europeans, not quote unquote black people. So in the summer of 2003, archaeologists excavated a 17th century site outside and an Annapolis, Maryland, and discovered the skeleton of a teenage boy. Examination showed that the boy had died sometime in the 1660s. Pay attention to that date, the 1660s. The boy had died sometime in the 1660s. He was about 16 years old and had tuberculosis. His skull showed evidence of a fearful mouth infection and herniated this and other injuries to his back were synonymous with years of hard toil. The youth was neither African nor Native American, which is the same thing, really. He was, he was Northern European, probably English. His remains were found in what had been a cellar of a 17th century house in a hole under a pile of household waste. It was as if the boy was so little account that after he died, he was thrown out with the rubbish. For, forensic anthropologists believe the youth was probably an indentured servant. The deceptively mild labor commonly used to destroy hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children shipped from Britain, Britain to America and the Caribbean in the 150 years before the Boston Tea Party in 1773. Most of these servants paid their passes to America by selling the rights to their labor for many a, a number of years. Others were forcibly exiled and sold into colonies as servants for up to 14 years. Many were effectively enslaved. While the Spanish slaughtered in America for gold, the English in America had to plant for their wealth, failing to find the expected mineral riches along the eastern seaboard, they turned to farming hoping to make gold from tobacco. They needed a compliant, subservient, preferably free labor to force. And since the indigenous people of America was difficult to enslave, they turned their own homeland to provide. <coughs> they turned to their own homeland to provide. <laughs> they imported Britons deemed to be surplus quote unquote people, the rootless and unemployed, the criminal and the descendant, and held them in the Americas in various forms of bondage for anything from three to life, three years to life.
This book tells the story of these victims of empire. They were all supposed to gain their freedom eventually. For many, it didn't work out that way. In the early decades, half of them died in bondage. This book tracks the evolution of the system in which tens of thousands of whites were held as chattels, mocked like cattle, punished brutally, in some cases literally worked to death. For decades, this underclass was treated just as savagely as black slaves and, indeed, tall suffered and rebelled alongside them. Evenly, a racially wedged was was thrust between white and black, leaving black officially enslaved and whites apparently upgraded, but in reality, just as enslaved as they were before. According to the contemporaries, some whites were treated with less humanity than the blacks working alongside them. Among the first to be sent were children. Some were dispatched by impoverished parents seeking a better life for them, but others were forcibly deported in 1618. The authorities in London began to sweep up hundreds of troublesome urchins from the slums and ignoring protests from the children and their families, shipped them to Virginia. England's richest man was behind this mass expulsion. It was represented, it was presented as an act of charity. The starving children, quote unquote, were to be given a new start as apprentices in America. In fact, they were, were sold to planters to work in the fields and half of them were dead within a year. Shipments of children continued from England and then from Ireland for decades. Many of these migrants were little more than toddlers. In 1661, the wife of a man who imported four Irish boys into Maryland as servants wondered why her husband had not brought some craters to have rock them in, as they were so little. A second group of forced migrants from the mother country were those such as vagrants and petty criminals from England's ruler wished to be rid of. The legal ground was prepared for their relocation by a highway man, chief priest, I mean chief justice, who argued for English diodes to be emptied in America. Thanks to men like him, 50,000 to 7,000 convicts, or maybe more, was transported to Virginia, Maryland, Barbados, and England. The other American possession before 1776. All manner of other considered undesirable by the British Crown were also dispatched across the Atlantic to be sold into servitude. They range, between, they range from beggars to prostitutes, Quakers to cavaliers. The third group was the Irish. For centuries, Ireland had been something of a special case in England's colonial history from the anglo normans onward. <clears throat> the, Irish were, the Irish were dehumanized, described as savages, so making their murder and displacement appear all the more justified. The colonization of Ireland provided experiences, experience and drive for experiments further afield, not to mention large numbers of workers coerced, transported, or persuaded under Oliver Cromwell's ethnic cleansing policy, policy in Ireland. Unknown numbers of Catholic men, women, and children were forcibly transported to the colony, and it did not end with Cromwell for at least another hundred years. Forced transportation continued as a fact of life in Ireland. Other unwilling participants in the colonial labor force were the kidnapped. Astounding numbers are reported to have been snatched from the streets and countryside by gangs of kidnappers or spirits, quote unquote, working to satisfy the colonial hunger for labor. 
based at every side of a porter in the British Isles, spirits cone, coned and coerced the unwary onto ships bound for America. London's most active kidnap gang discussing their targets at a daily meeting in St. Paul's Cathedral. They were reportedly paid $2 by planners, agents for every athletic looking young man that they brought aboard. According to the contemporary who campaigned against the, the black slave trade, kidnappers were snatching an average around 10,000 whites a year. Doubtless, doubt, doubtless an exaggeration, but one that indicates a problem serious enough to create its own grip on the popular mind. Along with the vast number of ejected from Britain and forced to slave in the colonies were the still greater multitude who went of their own free will. Those who became indentured servants in the Americas in return from free passage and perhaps the promise of, of a plot of, of land. Between 1620 and 1775, these volunteer servants, some 300,000, accounted for two out of the three migrants from the British Isles. Typically, these free willers, as they became to be called, were the poor and hopeful who agreed to sacrifice their personal liberty for a period of years in the eventual hope for a better life. On arrival, they found that they had the status of chattels, objects of personal property with few affected rights. But there was no going back. They, they were stuck like the tar on the hills of the ship that brought them. Some of them, some, some of course, were brought by humane, even generous masters and survived their years of bondage quite happily to emerge from servitude to build a prosperous future, but some with most abused servants were found among the free willers. It invites uproars to describe as slaves any of these hapless whites who were abused, beaten, and sometimes killed by their masters or their masters overseers. To do so is thought to detract from the enormity of black suffering after racial slavery developed. However, black slavery emerged out of white servitude and was based upon it. As the African-American writer Laron Bennett Jr. have observed, when someone removes the cataracts of whiteness from their eyes, and when we look with the unclouded vision on the bloody shadows of the American past, we will recognize for the first time that the Afro-American who was so often second in freedom was also second in slavery. Of course, black slavery had hideous aspects that white did not, did not experience, but they suffered horrors and comments, many of which were first endured by whites. In crude economic terms, indentured servants sold their labor for a set period of time. In reality, they sold themselves. They discovered that they were placed under the power of a master who had more or less total control over their, their destiny. The indentured servants evolved into slavery because of the economic goals of early colonists. It was designed not so much to help would be migrants get to America and the Caribbean as to provide a cheap and compliant workforce for the cash crop industry. Once this was established to keep the workforce in check, it became necessary to create legal sanctions that included violence and physical restraint. This is what led to slavery, first for whites, then for blacks. Proclamation against the disorderly transporting his majesty's subjects to the plantations within the parts of America, April 30th, 1637. By the king, 
the king's most excellent majesty being informed that great numbers of his subjects has been and are every year transported into those parts of America which has been granted by patent to several persons and there settle themselves some of them with their families and whole estates among which numbers there are also many idle and refractory humors whose only our principal end is to live as much as they can without the reach of authority his majesty having taken the premises into consideration is minded to restrain for the time to come such promiscuous and disorderly departing out of the realm and does therefore strictly charge and command all and every of the officers and ministers of his several ports in England, Wales, and Berwick that they do not hereafter permit or suffer any person being subsidy men are of the value of subsidy men to embark themselves in any of the said parts are the member thereof the members thereof for any of the said plantations without license from his majesty's commissioners for plantation first had the op, had and obtained in the behalf nor that they admit to be involved in any position I mean any person under the degree of value of subsidy men without the attestation or certificate of justice of peace living next to the palace where the party last of all or lately then before dwelt that he has taken the oath of supremacy and allegiance and like testimonials from the minister of the parish of his conversation and conformity conformity my bad to the order of disciplines of the Church of England and further his majesty expressed will and pleasure is that the officers and ministers of his several ports and the members thereof do return to his majesty said commissioner from plantation every half a year a particular a perfect list of names and qualities of all such persons as shall from time to time be involved in any of the said courts for any of the said plantations and of these his majesty royal time command all the officers and ministers of his said ports and members thereof are to take care as they will answer the neglect thereof of their perils. God at our given at our court at Whitehall the last day of April in the 13th year of our reign. God save the king. Imprinted by London, imprinted at London by Robert Barker, printer to the king's most excellent majesty and by the sign of John Bill 1637. So, as you can see, in the 1600s, Europeans was, was slaves in America. You know, and they tell a story that in 1619, that's when the Africans arrived in Jamestown. But as you can see, this proclamation against the disorderly transporting his majesty's subjects to the plantations within the parts of America, that was in 1637. But if the story that these Africans 
works so good. Let's pull that story up. Pull that story up. Where is it? Here it is, right here. Pull that story up. Because they say slavery, there's a history of slavery. It started in 1619 on to the present day because we don't have an ending. You see that, right? It says in 1619, the other crucial event that would play a role in the development of America was the arrival of Africans to Jamestown. The Dutch slave trade exchanged this cargo of Africans for food in 1619. The Africans became a dental servant, similar in legal position to many poor Englishmen who, who traded several years of labor in exchange for the passage to America. The popular conception of a racial-based slave system did not develop until the 1680s. So they let you know that all the way from the early 1600s, you know what I'm saying? And even, I, you know, could early 1600s, they let you know it was already going on that Europeans was already slaves. They was already in servitude. But our people like to say that, you know, we've been in servitude since like 500 years we've been in servitude. And that's, that's not accurate. That's not really the truth, you know what I'm saying? Because I can show you through, uh, just through my research. See, I'm pulling this stuff straight off the top because this stuff that I research and I know I'm going straight to it. Look, show you through research. Too many black amours, deportation, discrimination, and Elizabeth the first, Emily C. Bottles. I don't know who this lady is, but I, I, I do believe her information check out from my studies from stuff that I read, right? So it said, in 1596, Queen Elizabeth issued an open letter to the Lord Mayor of London announcing that there are of late divers black moors brought into this realm of which kind of people there are already here too minty, quote unquote. Damn, she, she talked ignorant too. <laughs> <laughs> and ordering that they be deported from the country. One week later, she reiterated her good pleasure to have those kind of people sent out of the land, quote unquote, and commissioned the merchant Casper Van Cedar to take up, quote unquote, certain black moors here in this realm and to deport them into Spain and Portugal. Finally, in 1601, she complained again about the great numbers of Negars and Black Amores, which, as she is informed, are crept into this realm, defamed them as infidel, having no understanding of Christ or his gospel, and one last time authorized their deportation. England was, of course, no stranger to strangers, nor to discrimination against them, as Laura Hunt Youngblood has shown. European immigrants constituted a, noted, a noticeable part of the English population starting in the 12th century, although they could gain some rights to citizenship, the crown tax or restricted their residency whenever political or economic expediency warranted. Elizabeth herself repeatedly authorized the expulsion of immigrants, yet Elizabeth's orders to deport certain black aboards, quote unquote, are in fact unique, for they are articulate and an attempt to put into place a race-based cultural barrier of a sort England had not seen since the, the expulsion of the Jews 
which really are the same people because we know the history, at the end of the 13th century and justifying the geographical uh, alternation of certain quote unquote Negro guards and black amours, the queen set them categorically apart from her own Liege people. While she figures the English in terms of their national allegiance, she designates the Negars and Black Amores as a kind, quote unquote, of people. Those kind, defined by skin color, the blackness stressed by Negars and Black Moors, and associated less inclusively with religion or lack of religion, most are infidels, that is, against the contrasting um, national identity of her subject, she depicts and condemns Negars and Black Moors generically as a race, a black race. So I'm going to start right there, but as you can see, there was so many of us in England and so many of us flooding England that she was ordering a deportation and, and kicking us out. But the thing is, if, if slavery was, you know what I'm saying, already bumping, it was already bumping for 500 years like our people claim, but it was already and you know cause this 100 years this 104 years after Columbus right and Columbus supposed to have been the father of slavery he brought slaves back from the Caribbean and supposed to have did all that so they already had supposed to have been smashing us up for like 104 years so why is it a big old problem that all these slavery all these slaves, these good hard working slaves has overflowed our realm. And now we gotta kick our slaves out and send them somewhere else to be slaves. Cause it's just too many slaves here. And we already had a lot of slaves here. That don't make any sense, you know? So that's how you gotta study and know that, you know, people lying to you. They telling you about you know what I'm saying? The, 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 the middle passage story that was just a story that turned into the African diaspora that turned into the transatlantic slave trade by European abolitionists, you know, telling a fable story at the same time uh, engaging in vert right stuff, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, just keep that in mind. But it it is it's been unraveled in a different kind of way. I believe. I don't think I ever see nobody debunk the slave myth the way that I'm doing it right now. So, you know, bear with me because I got more stuff to help y'all see. Uh, this here is uh, a fraud teaching, you know. This is a fraud teaching. They teaching our people that we came here on slave ship. Last, I'm gonna use this to debunk the slave narrative as we know it. This is from the Office of Historian. Check it out. Government site. Government site. This from their own site, from the horse's mouth. Listen to this. The Barbary Wars, 1801 to 1805, and 1815 to 1816. The Barbary states were a collection of North African states. Which of uh, which many of which practice state supported piracy in order to exact tribute, 
exact tribute from weaker Atlantic powers. Morocco was an independent kingdom. Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli owned a loose allegiance to the Ottoman Empire. I mean, they owed a loose allegiance to the Ottoman Empire. The United States fought two separate wars with Tripoli, 1801 to 1805, and Algiers, 1815 to 1816. Although at other times, it preferred to pay tribute to obtain the release of captives held in Barbary states. So they preferred to pay for the release of their captives. Remember, the Barbary states is some North African states, these brothers. So how could you, on one hand, say that you were snatching slaves off the Ivory Coast bringing them to America, forcing them in servitude, you know, and you got a record of doing this from, you know, the 1600s all the way to present day down there. But in reality, you was paying tribute to obtain the release of your own captain. You can't be the, the superpower that's snatching up the slaves on one side of the coin and on the other side of the coin the weaker the weaker powers the weaker weaker Atlantic power that preferred to pay tribute for the release of your captain like you can't you talking out the side of your neck like you can't say that. Now listen to this. You're gonna hear some more, you're gonna catch some more stuff. Right? Check it out. The practice of state supported piracy. Notice they keep saying state supported piracy. It was it, it was it was the Sultan saying, Europeans owe us. Go get out, go get my money. They can't do nothing until they pay us. They gotta pay tribute. The practice of state-supported piracy and ransoming of captives was not wholly unusual for the, its time. Many European states commissioned privateers to attack each other's shipping and also participate in the transatlantic slave trade. Now, didn't they just lie right there? They say, oh, so they they paid they they paid us to go rob their brother. That makes sense to you, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna pay you to go rob my brother. You know what I'm saying? Like be for real, be for real. Check it out. So they say the two major European powers, Great Britain and France found it expedient to encourage the Barbary state's policy and pay tribute to them as it allowed their merchants shipping an increased share of the Mediterranean trade and Barbary leaders chose not to challenge the superior British or French navies. Then they just lie, you know what I'm saying? They just lie to say they found it expedient to encourage the Barbary state's policy and pay tribute to them. And then in the same tongue, come back and say that the Barbary people didn't want no smoke with the British and French and the navies, man. These people, man, you, you just gotta watch them. You know what I'm saying? You gotta be able to read, not read between the lines, read the lines. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, man, I'm just showing you. So this is 1801, you know what I'm saying? So still, 
it's still not it's still not the you know the 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 history that we was taught and it proved that if the United States was paying tribute to Morocco in the 1800s, you know what I'm saying, a few years after the, the, the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, that it should tell you something. It should, it should tell you that the whole story about the slave trade gotta have some kind of uh, kinks and bends in it that gotta be ironed out because it just don't make no sense for you to be the big all powerful uh, creators of slaves on one side of the coin and on the other side of the coin you this weak little pussy ass motherfucker that gotta pay tribute you know what I'm saying excuse my language I forgot I'm doing this trying to be educational for everybody the children too so maybe I I had to find a way to edit that out. But yeah, man, like, you know, we just got to be a whole lot more wiser than what we have been trying to understand this deep, deep, deep mind control that they have on us. So this is one of the things to break the mind control. I think this is, a, uh, you know what I'm saying, cracking the codes. Like one on one right here, just understanding that, you know what I'm saying? This is your land, man. It's been yours. You've been here. You ain't come from nowhere. They all did. Everything that I just read proved that they came from somewhere and they came here as slaves and they came here unwillingly. They came here kidnapped. Some of them even came here willingly because things were just so bad in Europe for them. But hopefully I did a good job in trying to prove this from another perspective that I haven't seen any other people, you know what I'm saying, making videos like use these particular, uh, well, I have seen other people mention they were uh, white cargo and they were white and they were slaves. So I don't want to be like, I'm the only one that's using that. But I don't think that they used it in the capacity to, uh, you know what I'm saying, to try to prove or uh, uh, debunk the, the uh, slave narrative as we know it. Or maybe they did and I just didn't know about it, you know what I'm saying? I ain't trying to get no credit. I just want people to understand some certain things like I do, you know what I'm saying? Peace and love.